amplified version of the Bible. Just reading five verses here, starting in chapter two, verse one. Joshua, son of Nun, sent two men secretly from Shittim as scouts, saying, go, view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and came to the house of a harlot named Rahab, and they lodged there. It was told to the king of Jericho, behold, there came men in here tonight of the Israelites to search out the country. And the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, bring forth these men, who have come to you, who entered your house, for they have came and set to search out this land. Verse four, but the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. So she said, yes, two men came to me, but I didn't know, know from where they came. And at the gate closing time, after dark, the men went out. And where they went, I just don't know. Pursue them quickly, for you will catch them. You'll take them, you'll overtake them. The Bible goes on to tell us that she had brought them up to the roof and hidden them under the stalks of flax and she had, that she had laid an order there, which is a teaching in itself. I don't know how far I'll get today, but I'll do whatever the Holy Spirit tells me to do. Let me start by saying, this was a woman of faith. She wasn't always that way, but she saw the amazing works of God. She saw the amazing works of God in her country. She heard about them from strangers. And somehow, things started to ha happen in, in, uh, in this woman's life. Just like all of us, you know, we give our hearts to Christ at a certain time in life, but I believe that the, the Lord works with us up until that point. It could be weeks, it could be months, it could even be years. But eventually, it comes to a crescendo where you say, you know what, I've had enough, I want God. Is anybody here? And this was my experience. I know that God was working in my heart for many years. I can look back now and see it but I wasn't aware of it at, the same, at that time. So to recap the story so far, let me just share with you that Joshua and the Israelites, they are on uh, the border of the land that God had promised to them. For 40 years, beloved, they had been wandering about in this desert, 40 years, but God is finally going to give them what he had promised. Sometimes God promises things and we don't see it right away. And as I've said many times to you, you know, we, we are a people that are very, very impatient. And everyone, in, in, I mean, most human beings are, but I think as an American, I can say we're used to everything being instant. God's not instant. He has a reason for delay. Delay is not denial. God knows everything. There's nothing hidden from the all-seeing eye or the all-hearing ear. His ear is not deaf that it cannot hear and his arm is not short that it cannot save. So remember what I just said to you. You may be in a waiting period right now and you may be wondering when God's gonna start to move or start to bless you or do whatever. You can fill in the blanks. Just be patient. Through faith and patience, we inherit the promises of God. That's what the scripture tells us. So they had been wandering, however, the important pagan city of Jericho stands between them and the land. So Joshua sent two spies. They went over the river to check out the city. They reported back to him, as I just read. We're told in verse one, of chapter two, that the spies go to stay at the house of Rahab the prostitute. You may have a footnote that suggests that Rahab may not have been, or may have been an innkeeper and not a prostitute, but you can take it to the bank, she was a prostitute, okay? The New Testament is unequivocal on this matter. That was her profession. And of course, the prostitute's house was an inspired choice of place for these spies to stay. The, this was them undercover, so to speak, you know. The, the, they, did not, they did not want to be seen anywhere else. 
So nobody was going to check who was going in and out of a brothel. It's that, it's that clear. It's that simple to say. What better place to find out for them all of the gossip about what was going on in the city? But it appears, and it's really exciting when you see this because God's like this amazing chess player. Your move, my move, your move, my move. He, he, he has a tapestry of all of our lives and he knows exactly where each thread's going to go to bring forth and bring around his perfect will for our lives. So it appears that Rahab may have been moving into, by now, a more respectable trade that nobody knew much about, working with flax. And she hid the spies under these large stalks of flax drying on the flat roof of her house. In Rahab, the spies had found an ally and they knew it, but they just didn't find Rahab. God's hand in this great chess game was moving. He was doing what only God can do. I want you to hear that again. Only God can move the way he wants to move in your life. And if you, if you, you know, submit to that and you, you go, you know, you go to God and you say, Lord, I might not understand everything I'm going through right now. I mean, who does understand? Whether it's this coronavirus, whether it's layoffs and jobs, whether it's tragedies, whatever. Who does understand? You tell me who's got all the answers. I would love to meet them. But I do know one person that does. His name is Jesus. And he said he'll never leave us. So until we get to the other side, right now we see through a glass dimly. We see through a glass dimly. We do not see the full picture. But if you hold on to that nail scarred hand, I'll promise you one thing, what the enemy meant for evil, God will work out for good. I've seen it time and time and time and time and time and time again in my life. When I thought all was over, it wasn't. So we see that it appears that she'd already started another trade. She hid these men in the flax. What was it that made her take such an incredible risk? We're talking life and death here. We're talking being killed in an instant as she was found out. And it wouldn't just have been a quick kill. She probably would have been taken into the middle of the city and made a a mockery of all, you know, in front of everyone. She could have died a slow, terrible death. She took a chance. Somewhere in that woman's life, she reached out to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he heard her. Amen. He heard her. So what was it that made us take such an incredible risk? What made Rahab betray her own people. That's a big one. I believe that she saw the signs of the times. And beloved, if I could say anything to all of us here today, those listening to me by YouTube in different areas of this campus, I'm telling you, it's time to open your eyes and see the signs of the times. This is very serious times, but it's also very great times, knowing that we're not alone, that God says, I've fought the battle for you. I'll fight your battles, just you believe, and God will come through. So I believe that she saw the signs of the time. What Rahab saw was that her world was destined for destruction. Wow. You and I, don't have to wait till everything goes south, so to speak, till everything falls apart. No, we don't have to wait until that, but as human nature goes, we most of the time, we always do wait till we hit rock bottom, but we don't have to. 
It wasn't just that there was a large army camped just over the river from her. After all, Jericho was a heavily fortified city. No, Rahab knew that they had no chance not because of the armies, uh, of, uh, you know, of their armies. No, no, it, she knew they had no chance because it was God's kingdom itself that was coming. It was God's kingdom. These men that she took into her home, she knew they were the, the, the people that, that honored and served God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and that's the same God we honor today. And she knew these, the, the armies of the enemy didn't stand, truthfully, a snowball's chance in hell. Because she knew what God, her God, this God that she was now beginning to serve, had already done. She had heard about the Red Sea drying up. She had heard about the miraculous works. She knew this was the real and true and living God. She knew, and that's, what she, and she, that's why she did it. Because she said to herself, if I can make a deal with these men, they'll, I'll be saved and my family will be saved because if I know if they're serving this living God, this true living God, then they're not gonna break their word to me. Because let me tell you something, God's word will not be broken. Whatever happens in your life, God will come through at the end of the day. At the end of the day, we haven't seen the end yet. He's not finished writing our story yet. Oh, hallelujah. Oof. And she said to them, I know. Can you see? How did she know? She was shut, she was shut up in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, a room, you know, a, a little, little house that was right in the middle of the wall. How did she know all this? Oh, it's amazing how news travels. They didn't have internet, they didn't have, have websites, they didn't have, you know, whatever. Your cell phones, all the rest of it, no. They, could, they couldn't go into to Facebook, find out what's going on. They had the grapevine, you're absolutely right. It's still the same grapevine today. Word travels fast. Even though she was a prostitute, kind of isolated from everyone, she still heard the news. She had the good news. She had the good news that there was a real and true and living God that was saving Israelites and their families. So she said to them, I know, I know, that's a, that's a bold statement. I know that the Lord has given this land to you. Wow. And a great fear of you, she's saying to these men, has fallen on us, the people of Jericho. So that's all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. They were, they're afraid of you. There's coming a day, beloved, when the church of the living God will rise up in this country and in this world and people will be in awe. And when I say fear, I mean afraid of you because of the power of God that will emanate from the church. I believe that. And I believe if we have to come through with all this fire we're coming through, I believe God will make us stronger and stronger and stronger in the end times like we have never been before. And I believe that we will see signs and wonders like we have never seen before. And I pray to God I'm spared to see at least some of it. Because I know when I even spoke over those kids this morning, those young people this morning, this their generation is gonna see the mighty works of God. They're gonna see things our generation never saw. Oh, hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. And she goes on to tell them. She goes on to speak to them. She tells them all, up right up to verse 11. She said, we've heard, we've heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites, east of the Jordan, whom you, listen to what she said, we know that you completely destroyed them, you annihilated them. And when we heard it, our hearts melted and everyone's courage failed because of you. 
Listen to what else she said. For the Lord your God is God in heaven, in heaven above and in the earth below. Did you hear what I just said? Do you see the revelation that this woman had? She had a revelation that was incredible. We have heard, you see, her first act of faith that we see in verse one was she let the spies stay at her house, but somehow news about them and what they were about to do got leaked out. And the king sent guards to Rahab. You imagine what she must have felt like when she saw those guards? She knew this, either, either you're, you're real or I'm gone. They were not playing tiddlywinks. They were, gonna do, they were gonna torture her, do whatever they had to do to get her to open up and tell them where those spies were. They weren't playing games. And she knew it when she saw those guards. So somehow, inside of her, she prayed. And somehow, her God came to her defense. Supernaturally, he allowed her voice to go out there and they believed her. They believed her. Somehow, the news got to them. Oh yes, well, we say somehow, but God's in it all. So that was her first act of faith. The second act of faith was to, to, in protecting the Israelites by sending the guards on a wild goose chase. I don't know how you feel about this, but I'm telling you, I love, I love this woman, Rahab. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to seeing her someday. And I'm gonna say, you know, the way you talked to those guards were a classic, honey. It was a classic. Listen to how she did this. Yes, she said. She wasn't denying that they were there. Yes, the men came to me, but I didn't know where they had come from. Oh, really? And at dusk, when it was time to close the city gates, guess what, guys? The men just left. Wow. I didn't know you were coming. I've added that in. I didn't know you were coming. They just left. I don't know which way they went. She was acting, as we would say today, just dumb, okay? Dumb, dumb, and dumber. I don't know the way they went. But I will tell you this, go after them quickly because you may catch up with them. She already knew where they were underneath the flax. They're up there while she's talking and they can hear what she's saying to these guards. I mean, this had to be hysterical. They must have been laughing up there because she was doing one heck of a job. She should have got an Oscar. Hallelujah. Seriously. So go, to, go quickly, go quickly. Out of all of the people of Jericho, Rahab, listen carefully, Rahab, the harlot was the only one who did anything. The others had belief, but Rahab had faith. Kind of like the story I told years ago about the preacher that was preaching about asking God for rain. And everybody came, they were in a drought. Uh, and everyone came and they were all sitting there and they were, yes, sir, yes, pastor, praise God, hallelujah. All of a sudden, this little boy in the front row, little girl it was, excuse me, put up a red umbrella right in the middle of the service. And the pastor looked over and said, what? What are you doing? And it dawned on him, dawned on him. One of his congregants had faith enough to act like there was going to be rain. I never forgot that story because it's the truth. Faith without works is dead. We've got to believe God. We've got to speak it and believe it whether we see it or we don't. We have to trust him through the good and through the bad and believe him to bring us out the other side with his grace and his honor and his glory. That's what we have to do as Christians. And that's what we're commanded to do in the times that we're living in because they're coming when all this is over, whenever it is over, they're coming to the church. Just like this woman Rahab's heart was turned towards God in her hour of peril, the church is going to have to be ready to take, in, to, 
the influx of people that will be coming because they will have had enough of the world. And it's coming quicker than we can ever imagine, beloved. So listen, out of all of the people, she was the only one that did anything. The others believed, yes, but Abraham had faith and moved. This shows us a sharp distinct, distinction between the two. James the apostle says, you believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that and they shudder. James pointed, James point rather, is that a saving faith is not just a set of correct beliefs. It is a belief that will act, beloved. A belief that will act when all hell breaks loose and when there's no proof that you're ever going to see the result the way you're believing. You act like it and you trust them. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. James says of Rahab, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. I could just see God up in heaven. I really could just looking down at that woman saying, well, I know what you were, but I now know what you are, honey. Just wait till you come up here. Great is going to be your reward. Oh, I, do you believe that? Yes. Give him a big praise. Come on. <laughs> believe it. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. So she gave lodging to them. Rahab believed. She acted on it. And now, listen carefully. In some ways, Rahab's story is very much like Corrie ten Boom. In wartime Holland, it was occupied by the Nazis. Corrie ten Boom and her family, she had Jews from persecution and risked their lives many times. Many, many times. This little woman, Rahab, did the same thing with the spies. They believed in a God that they had never seen, but they believed he was real. Of course, there's a book called The Hiding Place, and those of you saw it many years ago, we saw the movie, The Hiding Place. I will never forget that movie, how she shared that her uh, sister died in the concentration camp before she was set free, and Corrie Ten Boom's uh, her, her, her being able to walk out of that camp was nothing short of a mar miraculous move of God. Everything froze around her and the gates opened and she walked through free. It was an amazing situation. But a few years later, she was in a, in a, a company, a gathering of people. And this is what I talked about last week. God's not, God's not telling us, he's not suggesting that we love. He's commanding that we love. He's commanding that we love each other like we've never loved each other. And love means covering a multitude of sin when you have to. Love means forgiving. Love means turning the other cheek. And she was in this gathering of people and this man took the pulpit and she, immediately she recognized him. Please bear with me because I don't remember his name or any of those things, but she recognized that man immediately as the, the guard at Auschwitz that, that killed her sister, the one that, that he was also involved in, in many medical things that was absolutely atrocious. And she hated him with a passion when she was in that camp. Everyone did. He was one of the top Nazis that everyone, even, even the Germans hated this man. And so when she heard, he started to talk about Jesus. And she said, I couldn't believe my ears. She said, everything about me was screaming, get out of here, get out of here. You, you, you get out of here before you kill him. Move. She couldn't. She was frozen in her seat. Frozen in her seat. And at the end of this whole meeting, he spoke to her and he said, Fraulein, are you okay? And she just broke in his arms. And she said, I know, and, and I can't believe you are the same man. But she said, God has told me in his word 
that I must love unconditionally. What a story. And he asked and begged her to forgive him. We may think that people are beyond the, the hand of God, the length of God's hand. No, 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 no. It's the ones that you think that could never see God are the ones that God might surprise you with. God likes to do stuff like that. So, Corey Ten Boom and her family hid the Jews. At the, at, they could have been killed themselves. Both Corey Ten Boom, listen, and Rahab acted on their faith while others remained silent. And both were traitors to the world they found themselves in. One in a heathen Jericho and the other in Nazi-occupied uh, Europe. What did they have? The title of my message. They had faith in God. Look at all the things that happened to them in this world. Look at all the abuse and the, the terrible things that happened to them. And I'm sure many times, just like you and I, would they be crying out, why God, why? You promised me this, why, why? Why is this happening? Look, why am I doing this? Why do I have to hide in an attic? And they went for days without food until a baker could bring something to them and s sneak it in. Why? If you've ever read the, di the diary of Anne Frank, if you've never read it, get it. You'll probably get it today on YouTube, whatever. I know there's a movie out too. That young woman, wrote a diary in that, praising God, praising God. As each time she would hear the door underneath open, she never knew if that was her last day. Folks, we might think we're being persecuted and to a degree there's things going on behind the scenes I'm not gonna talk about today. But I can tell you, this isn't persecution. You can still come here and you can still walk out free people. And that's why we pray. Long may we be able to continue to do that. In Jesus' name. So, they had faith in God. They both wanted the things of God, not the things of the world. So I'm going to continue next week, but I just want to close by, I want to just close by reading you something that I've read to you before, but it, it's so important to bring it into this message. Have faith in God, beloved. In a race, all the runners win. Um, excuse me, in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize. So run beloved, to get it. If I could ever ask you to do anything, don't ever stop with God. No matter how you might be abused, hurt, wounded, betrayed, all of these other things, I've been through the whole thing. All of it. But I refuse. I've come too long, too many years in Christ to give up now. I know that what I can't see, God sees. What I don't know, God knows. What I can't hear, God hears. God hears what's going on. Nothing's a surprise to him. And so, 1 Corinthians 9.24 says, in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize. Long before Alexandria, Alexandra, excuse me, Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone a German school teacher named Reese almost did. My point of closing with this is keep going. Don't stop. You might just stop just before your miracle. Just before God's going to do something. You might find yourself on the outside looking in. Don't let that happen to you. Don't let hurts and wounds stop you. Don't let the enemy stop you. Because my Bible tells me in Romans 8, 38, everything that can ever come against me, heaven and hell and demonic forces and all of the things can never separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, my Lord. Hell, high water, nothing. And the same 
book, Romans 8, 28 tells us that he will work together all things for good according, according to how we believe, according to that word that worketh in us. He will work all things together to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Don't give up just before the miracle. And trust me, I've been there. Don't think I'm just talking to you today. I've had to get me by the, 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 ear, by the ear and I'm still doing it. I'm still doing it. I still have to talk to me because I have a responsibility that I better be talking to you the way I'm living. No other way. When you stand behind this desk, you better have integrity. You better be walking in honor. You better be doing things right to the best of your ability. Because we're living in times, beloved. We better be, that's all I'm saying. So, this man, Reese, let me get back here for a moment if you just bear with me. So a German uh, school teacher named Reese almost did. Reese's phone could convey the sounds of whistling and humming, but not speech. Something was missing. Many years later, when Reese won thousands of an inch, excuse me, I'm, I'm saying this wrong, bear with me. When Reese had given up, Bell discovered his error. Reese gave up. Bell came behind him and found a tiny screw that controlled the ele electrodes, electrodes was off by one thousandth of an inch. Can you imagine that? One thousandth of an inch. When Bell made this minor modification, he was able to transmit speech loud and clear. And may I add, he fulfilled a great purpose. Now that purpose was given to Reese before him. But Reese gave up. What has God got for you that you're toying with? Huh? Don't listen to the enemy that says you'll never make it. This will never happen. No. You listen to God's voice. And as soon as you've heard God's voice, God's voice, you won't need the voice of man. There'll be many times I've gone for wise counsel, very much wise counsel. I just met with my own pastor last week. Pastor Reed came here to this church. Was absolutely thrilled, amazed at the work that's happened here over the years. So I'm not above getting counsel for anyone, from anyone, anyone I trust. But what I'm trying to say is if I've heard from God, I won't need that counsel. I will walk in faith because I'm not afraid. Perfect love casteth out all fear and a faith worketh by love. And so if I have a peace that I've heard from God, then that's what I follow after. If I still need counsel, I would go, but that's most of the time I don't. Because I know if I don't obey God, what's all this about? You hear? We have to obey God. Everything else is second. And you say, well, how do I know if it's God? Do you have peace? Do you have pleasantness? That's how you know. Peace and pleasantness is his ways. You know. You might just be a little baby Christian today listening to me and you wouldn't understand what I'm saying but as you get older in the things of God he'll show you hallelujah so think about this for a moment and I'm closing an adjustment so small that you could hardly measure it made the difference between success and failure and it changed history wow there are two lessons for you and I in this one 
Most of the time, it's the little things that open the door or close it, like being kind instead of critical, cooperative instead of comp competitive, disciplined instead of impulsive, and consistent instead of trying to make a big splash. It's the little acts, the little attitudes that they either work for you or against you. Number two, if Reese had persisted or reached for help, his name could be on the telephone today. Instead, it's, it's Belle's name that's on the telephone. Keep pursuing your God-given purpose, beloved, and listen again. In a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize. Beloved, I want each and every one of you to get that prize at the end of the day. And in the process, as we go through this journey together, have faith in God. In Jesus' name, I'm finished. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. If we could bow our heads for a moment, just in prayer for a moment. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I pray for you today. I pray for each and every one of us. And I pray that we will all hear his voice clearly and make the decisions in life that we have to make. Follow the word. Follow after peace. I pray for your safety today. I pray for your health today. I pray that you will hear his voice say to you, no, don't do this. Don't go there. Stay here. Stay home today. That still small voice might tell you to do that. You don't know. It's the still small voice that will come through at the end of the day. So today I pray in Jesus' name that God would prosper you and allow you to be in health even as your soul prospers. I pray that grant, God will grant unto you the desires of your heart. I pray that you will not be moved or tossed around with every wind of doctrine, but you will open the word of God and have rhema from God himself to you, to your heart. I pray for your children and your children's children, your seed and your seed seed, that should the Lord tarry, they will serve the Lord. And I pray that when we leave here today, and if we're in a public place, we'll, we'll be courteous and kind and do something that Christians should do, love people. And if there's somebody that you know that you didn't see here today, even from, I'm talking to those outside, I know it's hard to know who's here and who's not, but if God puts somebody on your heart, that's what Christianity is all about. It's not about this brick building, beloved. It's about you, the people. Then pick up that phone, take a meal, take a dessert, do something, do something. And say, Lord, today I did my part. I called that one. I prayed for that one. This is what I pray for you today, that you will go in peace. And I bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God bless you. You are dismissed. Let's stand to our feet. Thank you.